Welcome to Health Reform 2.0, the only place on the internet for people with a curious mind and a desire for a better health care system. Here we take you on a journey of our current quagmire, tell you where it came from and why the government can't fix it. Along the way, we'll tell you some history, bust a few big myths, tell you a few stories, and give you an idea how we can work together and get the health care system we want. Let's get started. In the last episode, we explained why hospitals are so dangerous, and we showed you some of the data. At the end of the episode, we started to discuss some of the issues that arise because doctors are human. In this episode, we pick up at that point and we explain to you why doctors also are dangerous and how, for the most part, it simply isn't their fault. Getting You know, the best eyes, if you want to find out about a good doctor in a hospital, yeah. ask a nurse. Ask a nurse. Ask a nurse. Because they all know who they are. They do, but they can't talk about it. They all know who they are. They have their own little system of, I got to close my eyes over here because I know it's going to go, but I don't ever let that guy touch my, my, my loved one or whatever. They all know it, every one of them. Mm -hmm. So why is this the case? Because health care is the biggest trust equation in the world. Trust equals credibility plus empathy divided by risk. Again, you're really, really trusting because you have no control. Just as you had no control when they transported you over to the other hospital, not knowing the facts of what was going on with the out-of-network piece, right? which goes on. So we, us, the patient... We want to believe, we actually need to believe that not only is our doctor, you know, possesses superior knowledge and information and our doctor is committed to putting our interests ahead of his. And that, and that everything the doctor does now has a backup in science, a complete science reason to do it. Right. It is, they're trained to do the same thing the same way until something breakthrough comes along. Right. And after that breakthrough, it still takes forever to move into the marketplace. And all those breakthroughs added up today, ladies and gentlemen, only 25% of things doctors do have a basis in science. We knew years and years ago that PET-CT scans were the best possible thing for the staging of oncology patients. Do you know how many years it took it to become mainstream? Over I, 25 I, years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as a customer patient, we are all uniquely in a vulnerable position. You can't sample the product beforehand. There's a real possibility that the product will do you more harm than good. Oh, and if it proves useless, guess what? You're still going to pay for it. Exactly. Exactly. More, And you're going to pay for it at a higher price. This is one marketplace where buyer beware cannot apply. Exactly. Tom, you want to go over some of the top medical errors? Yeah, and it, these are going to come up on the screen. We'll list them fairly quickly and, and just give you a little bit of understanding. But the number one thing that can kill you is misdiagnosis. Number one on the list is misdiagnosis. It's the, mo uh, the most common type of medical errors is errors in diagnostics. And it's not surprising since the right diagnostic is the key to your treatment and recovery. Um, now, you can read the rest of this on the screen, but the main point of this is 50% of diagnosis is wrong. That has been confirmed on anecdotal information. It's been confirmed on reviews of medical records. And most importantly, it has been confirmed by the review of death certificates and cause of death against what the initial diagnosis was. Doctors get it right about 50% of the time. So you can imagine if they're wrong in the diagnosis and you go get treatment, you're at a huge risk. Now, the reality is that risk is modified because, again, only 25% of what they do has a basis in scientific, what's called a scientific best practice. In other words, they understand the cause and effect and they're trying to treat the cause. The rest of it is just this is the way we do it. Why is it you walk away from this and a lot of people don't die from bad diagnosis? Because the body's pretty good at healing itself for the most part. And the error isn't catastrophic because it's not dealing with heart disease. It's not dealing with yeah. perforated lungs. It's not dealing with a brain hemorrhage and the things that, that become very critical very fast. So there's an uh, article I sent you uh, January 28th, Modern Healthcare, entitled Coalition Tackling Diagnostic Error Gains Some Traction. Mm -hmm. At least somebody's talking about it. 
Um, this is from um, Chief Quality Officer at Northwell Health. Uh, the wrong diagnosis leads to delays in treatment and increases cost. It puts burden on the healthcare system as a whole. In this particular study, it showed one in 20 people. I think it's higher than that uh, under misdiagnosis. Uh, we do know for a fact, based on studies, that a little over 30% of the diagnostic radiology reads are wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a fact. And, and so uh, that's a pretty high number, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when you think about it. So uh, something to consider on this mis misdiagnosis issue. All right. The, 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 the next two I'm going to lump together. One is unnecessary treatment, and then the other is unnecessary tests and deadly procedures. Now, these things are problems. Unnecessary treatment is a problem because every treatment they do to you, whether it's drug or medically related, mm -hmm. uh, in other words, actual <clears throat> practice of medicine as opposed to application of a drug, they're risky. They all have risks. Just We talked in the last episode, just look as an example of the drugs that you see advertised every night on, the, on, on your television. They tell you a lot of these drugs can cause you to commit suicide and... and liver bleeds and all kinds of other problems. I mean, they have side effects. And many times they don't include all of them. If you go online to the to the uh, physician's desk reference right. online and look these drugs up, uh, you, you're going to find that there's a lot of side effects that, that many oftentimes can be fatal for a lot of these little things you think you're going to do to get better skin. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... So there's a risk associated with that. And usually the risk is so many cases out of 100,000 people. And low risk, you know, looks low risk unless you're one of those few people that it, that it affects. Yep. Um, so you got unnecessary treatment, unnecessary tests, and deadly procedures. Well, why do we have so many unnecessary treatments and, and uh, uh, procedures and tests? Well, one is duplicated services. Number one is because I go see this doctor and then I go see another doctor and they're not communicating and coordinating my care and they both order the same tests. And most of the time, patients don't know what they're doing. You get the sheet, most people look at it and they see all this gobbledygook down there shorthand and they don't know what this is. They get a CBC or they get a, all these different kinds of tests. You don't know what they're doing. Many of them are duplicating what other tests are being done by another physician. Duplicated services is one, but there's one reason services are duplicated is lack of communication. Another reason du services are duplicated are because of defensive medicine. They run these tests because if they don't, is a potential that they're going to get sued because they didn't run a test. I think I got another reason why they do that too. You do? Yeah. And the third reason is? The third reason is... Quid pro quo, buddy. Yeah, money. Uh, one other point. Um, we talked about the medicines. We're going to talk about that in a minute. In a, in this, in a minute. Mm -hmm. you know, we have basically over-medicated people for, with things that don't do anything at all. For instance, let me give you an example. Viruses. Mm -hmm. Common cold. Do you think the z pack or antibiotics does anything for that? Hell no. Nothing. And yet, you go to the doctor because you're insistent that you take something. So what does he do? He writes you a prescription for it just to get you, get you off his back, knowing all the time it's not going to do any good. But yeah. what does it do harm? We start putting those antibiotics into our system. And guess what happens to the viruses, and not to the viruses, but to, to the different... Um, well, viruses, too. They and, mutate, they, mutate. they get stronger. They, right. they evolve to be stronger while we evolve to be weaker. And this is one of the reasons that hospital-acquired infections and these wonderful, you know, uh, bugs that you can't treat right. are, are start, have gotten out of control in some cases. So the next one, number four on the list, is medication mistakes. And over 60% of hospitalized patients miss their regular medication while they're in the hospital. On average, 6.8 medications are left out per patient. There's another problem with medication-related issues. A lot of people don't adhere to the protocol when they go home. They don't take the medicine when they're supposed to take it, or they don't take all of it. This is particularly a problem with antibiotics. Right. People go home, they're told to take this antibiotic for seven days, three times a day, three pills. They take it the first day, the second day they may forget to take a pill, the third day they take a pill in the morning, and then by the fourth and fifth day they feel good and they say, well, I'm not taking any more pills. 
Well, in some cases, the infections come back. In some cases, the infections don't come back, but there's still bacteria that are alive that are now stronger because there wasn't <clears throat> enough dose to kill them and they developed some level of resistance to it. Yeah. So medication mistakes not just happen because the wrong medication was given or there was an interaction between one medication and another that caused fatality. By the way, one other thing about medications, Many medications interact with things you eat. I have a medication I take for heart-related problems, and I can't eat grapefruit. Now, that I've never heard of a drug no. that I, I can't eat grapefruit. You can't even drink anymore. Yeah, but well, I can't drink alcohol. I can't drink, have coffee either. But you need to understand if there's any other interactions, not just medication. So when you go to the pharmacist to get a new prescription, and they show up to tell you, they say, you know, OK, well, I'm here for the initial consult. You know, can you tell me, uh, you know, what do you want to know? And they give you a list. Say, I want to know all of the contraindications for something else. I want to know all the things I can't eat, shouldn't eat, shouldn't take that, that could interact with this drug. And then they will walk through all them with you. And at least you'll have some idea of the areas you need to watch out for. I think this is interesting because, you know, I spend a great deal of time in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I always go to the pharmacies there, right? Mm -hmm. And we talk about the pharmacists being pretty educated. Here, I go to my, <laughs> they come out and push the button on the computer so they can hand me whatever they're handing me, right? Mm -hmm. I go there and I find the pharmacist. And he comes out from the back of the thing, wiping his shirt off, you know, his, his, his lunch off on his shirt. Yeah. And I sit there and talk to him and he explains all of this. Yeah. He knows he knows everything about this. He tells me exactly what to do and what not to do about that as he wipes his greasy fingers on his you know his white shirt. Right. Why I don't had, you know why American pharmacists don't spend time with patients? They don't get paid. They get paid to count and pour. Their job is to fill a prescription as quickly as possible so the patient can go out into the drugstore and spend another $80 or $60 on candy and makeup and things where they make money. So the people that own pharmacies don't want a pharmacist to come out and spend 15 minutes with you, even though legally they're required to spend a half, up to a half an hour with you for a consult when you first get a med medication. And sometime during the course of taking that medication, they should also meet with you again for 15 minutes to go over anything else that may have come up in the meantime. Never happens. By the way, don't take that wrong, ladies and gentlemen. This guy was fantastic, and just because he was having lunch, no, it wasn't but, but, his fault. But I love Mexico, and yeah. um, I've almost lived there. I've almost built a house. Do do, the next big issue is what we call never events. They're never events because they should never happen. And it's often things like operating on the wrong limb uh, or, or uh, a food or fluid that's supposed to go into the esophagus is directed into what ends up being a chest tube, the breathing tube, which causes aspirative related yep. problems. I had, I had an aspiration problem, but that wasn't the reason for it. <laughs> that was another thing that I ended up with lung failure on top of heart failure for a few days because of that. <laughs> I was in the spine surgery one time and I was operating the C-arm and the neurosurgeon and he had, he had an assistant. All of a sudden, the neurosurgeon starts screaming at this guy because the guy had a pair of scissors and he was getting ready to cut the spinal cord. Yeah, well, you know, mistakes happen, and, and we want doctors to be perfect, but if you haven't gar gathered by now, doctors are not perfect. They're human, and they don't have, we don't have enough understanding of the cause and effect of all these things um, to even know some of the stuff they need to know not to make mistakes. So it's, it's, it's a, it, there's just a lot of risk. You have problems in uncoordinated care where one doctor prescribes X, another doctor prescribes Y. You go to the to two different drug stores to get the drugs. They're not aware that you're taking another drug and there's a deadly interaction. You take the interaction and you die from it. That happens more often than you think. Um, they, they, one doctor is doing a surgical procedure that is impacting the system of another surgical procedure you may have had three or four months before that hasn't completely recovered. So, you know, you, you need to, the ideal way to, to eliminate a lot of problems is fully coordinated care and fully coordinated benefits, but we don't yep. have those today. That's right. um, infections from the hospital to you. 
uh, HAIs, uh, hospital acquired infections, the rate of hospital acquired infections has actually gotten a little better in the past few years, but it's gone from completely horrible to just horrible. And the infections you're getting in hospitals can be deadly, can be deadly. People die from these infections, sometimes in the hospital, sometimes after they go home. Hospital acquired infections are getting more deadly because they're beca those bacteria are becoming much more, and viruses are becoming much more resistant to treatment. So we're picking up very, very robust diseases in hospitals that the hospitals don't have in some cases any way to treat. There are 14 different bacteria, if you go to the CDC website, that there are almost none or no treatments for. So if you get them, there's little to nothing you're gonna do to, to treat it. If your body doesn't fight it off, you're gonna have a massive problem. So the one point on that, um State of California, I'm sure it's in other states, require uh, each hospital to have an antimicrobial program. Mm -hmm. Not all of them do it. Why don't they do it? A couple of reasons. One, they can't find an infectious disease guy that can come in because either it's a small rural hospital or whatever. Mm -hmm. Two, they're just poorly run, and they just don't do it. Why do you think they don't do it? And I'll give you the answer. It's because the, the fine is tremendously less money than actually paying for the program. Right, right. And, so, and there's, there's another thing on top of that. And again, not to, to go after nurses because nurses do a wonderful thing. But there are some nurses out there that when it comes time that they're supposed to wipe down your tabletop after you have uh, before you have dinner and wipe it down after you have dinner on your little tray. They don't do it. Why? Because as far as they're concerned, housekeeping's supposed to do that. They're a nurse. That's not what they do. There's so one, there's there's this practice d determination there that goes from one thing. There's to one more point that always kind of irritated me about this whole thing because you know I was in the in the uh, for a while I was over in the implant side of the business. So reps have to go through uh, web tracks now, and they have to be certified. You have to have your shots and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Probably a good thing. But here's the thing: it just gets me. You, you see these reps, and they're going from procedure to procedure, whether it's a hip, knee, kyphoplasty. They're going to different hospitals. Mm -hmm. Guess what they have on? The same s scrubs they had on when they started the morning. Right. right. And they go in. Now, they're not supposed to be in the sterile field. What's the sterile field? Well, it's a little line right across, the, right across here. Right. And right. so I'm always, because every time I went into surgery, I had to scrub in and all this kind of stuff. But I was in the surgical field. Right. But I just for, blows me away that we have to go through all this credentialing and everything. And yet you can wear your same stinky, ugly um, um, Scrub. scrubs back and forth, whatever hospital you want to wear. No one catches. No one says anything about it. Right. Well, because they're new to you. No, they're not. They, everyone knows who they are. <laughs> Guarantee you. So other than, other than infections, you have not so accidental accidents. And there's a number of accidents that happen in hospitals that can be related to like falling and breaking a hip, as an example. And that can be related to you got a heart condition, you have a defibrillator, the defibrillator doesn't work. Um, uh, there, there's a series of accidents that happen in hospitals. And and. They're often related to a failure someone else, somewhere else, but they get classified as an accident because it's, well, that was an accident. He tripped in the hallway. Well, why did he trip? Well, he tripped because we carried a patient through that had a bleed and some of the blood got on the floor and no one had time to clean it up before the patient went out and they didn't see it and slipped and fell. Yeah. I mean, there's lots and lots of things like that that happen also. You've got... Missed warning signs. Patients are getting worse. Nurses are overworked. They're in other rooms. The patient is starting to deteriorate and, and the nurse isn't checking on them enough. Now, again, that's not slamming the nurses, but nurses are they They understaff nurses because they're damn expensive and particularly at night. When I was in the hospital, there were nights that I didn't see a nurse all night. Now, yeah, I was being monitored. They had my heart monitor. They knew what was going on with my heart. But I didn't see a nurse unless I pushed the call button. I mean, it, it, they're supposed to come in and take certain tests sometimes at night. And by and large, they did. But I had two nights in my seven-day stay when I know they missed one of, the, one of the, the sample times they were supposed to come in and get my stuff. They were tied up with another patient. 
It, the time went by when they got out of that. By the time they were done with that, they just figured they'd do it at the next cycle. Well, so it's, it's, it goes beyond uh, and equipment malfunction is more than you think. I mean, if something breaks as a diagnostic machine, typically it's not life or death. Well, the, I can tell you right now. Yours wasn't a diagnostic. A hundred, a hundred yeah. percent of the time when I've had equipment used on me for my heart, it failed. Yeah. And again, they were <laughs> I doing, only had one they, instance. They were doing an interventional yeah. procedure. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you know when an MRCT goes down, you know, and they reschedule. It's, it's a completely different market uh, in the outpatient center versus the hospital. You're a captive audience in the hospital. Right. Uh, but things do malfunction. Uh, case in point would be you've got your E. We talked a lot about electronic medical records. Let's talk a little about patient monitoring systems by the side of your bed, right? Of which you were hooked to, right? I can give you <laughs> great examples of where all of a sudden there was a glitch in the system, and the system said you weren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. You were gone. You were discharged. Yep. Yeah. Guess what? <laughs> You're still uh, there. Not gonna, it, it's just, You're still there. Thank God for human intervention, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, ultimately what this comes down to is you're in a hospital and all these things can go wrong or you're being treated for a, a, a problem and you've got drug related issues. You've got diagnostic related issues. You've got all these other issues that can go wrong. And you're trusting the doctor to know everything, have a cure for everything, and then be able to provide you all that under the terms and conditions yep. he's operating between insurance companies and, and laws and everything else. And, and it's, it's, even if you're an educated consumer, as I consider myself to be in healthcare, um, it, it's it can be near impossible sometimes to be able to make effective decisions and understand what's going on. Um, you you need somebody. We call them a facilitator. They yeah. use the term advocate, but you really need somebody that you can pick up the phone and talk to or have come visit and talk to. I have a very good friend. I won't mention his name because this is health related issue. He has a horrible heart condition. He's had it for years. He's had multiple heart attacks, multiple surgeries. And when he gets sick, he calls me. And, and he had he had to be rushed to the hospital. He had diverticulitis and they had to go in. He went septic. They had to go in and do surgery and remove a piece of his colon. He called me as soon as he started to get information because he wanted me aware of what was going on. And when he went into surgery, I flew down to where he lives. And he had, because we've been through this before, had made sure the doctor knew he was to talk to me and explain whatever I asked. So I spent a couple of days with him before he went into surgery and after, and the doctor was talking to me as much as he was talking to the patient, and in some cases more, because I could ask intelligent questions of the doctor and get answers back that gave me a better understanding of what he was trying to do. And I could check that information with other people I may have known to make sure that what he had in his protocol was the best protocol for my friend. Now, I never got in a conflict with one of these guys, which is fortunate. There's been everywhere we've gone in his case has been good doctors. But um, have an advocate, have somebody that you can turn to and ask questions. And they don't need to know everything about healthcare. They just need to be dispassionate and have the ability to ask questions and drill into what doctors say and, and not just take everything they say at face value. And more importantly, right. they need to have two fingers so they can type G-O-O-G-L-E <laughs> and look it up. There's one point about that. And to you, and again, I, we, we experience this more than most people because we do get invited into these discussions. And I don't take any crap off these doctors. Mm -hmm. And so the other problem you need to do, if, you, if you're a, 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 an advocate, a facilitator, or a patient, and you're asking the hard questions, and you're not getting the answers, or they're blowing you off because they think you're stupid, you fire that person, get rid of them, and get somebody else. Exactly. Because you can do that, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to be led around. You stand up for yourself and you tell these people, I want answers to this and I want them now. And don't put up with their crap. And if they don't give it to you, march right over to the CEO of that hospital or you go to what, they're, what they call their quality manager and you complain. Right. Stand up for yourself.
make sure, make sure that you tell everybody treating you, if you have somebody that's helping you understand this, that they are to talk to that person. Sometimes they're gonna give you a form to allow them to do that. L listen carefully to what they tell you. Even when you're confused and have things, try to listen carefully. If you don't understand, have them repeat it. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. There are no dumb questions when it comes to your life. So, you know, don't be afraid to be dumb because your life really can depend on what your understanding of your treatment plan is going to be. Right. And if you can't get to the point where you understand your doc, like Tim said, get a new one. Get exactly. another doc. Fire get somebody him. that can talk to you. Fire him or her. Uh, because this, you know, healthcare is the riskiest thing you can do, and you need to protect yourself at every corner. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to Health Reform 2.0 with your hosts, Tom Loker and Tim Henning. We hope you found the topics interesting, that we answered a few questions, that you laughed a bit, and were entertained. Please feel free to invite your friends to join the discussion. And remember, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Send us your questions to info at hr-20.com. We hope to see you again next time.